was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. I bid my heart in love, and he wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. makes it right Sometimes my past seems dream without a ray of cheer And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day The mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies And just a little talk with Jesus clears the way Now let us have a little talk with Jesus Tell him all about our troubles He will hear our faintest cry And he will answer by and by And when you feel a little prayer will turn it You know a little fire is burning We'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right I may have doubts and fears My eyes be filled with tears But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night Go to him in prayer he knows my every care And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right Now let us have a little talk with Jesus Tell him all about our troubles He will hear our faintest cry And he will answer by and by When you feel a little prayer will turn it You know a little fire is burning We'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right standing please join us in worship this morning down at the cross where my savior died down where for cleansing from sin i cried there to my heart was the blood of iron glory to his name was the blood of life. Glory to His name. And I am so wondrously safe from sin. This is so sweetly abides with Him. There at the cross where He took me in. Oh, 
precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. So rich and sweet Cast your poor soul At the Savior's feet Plunge it today And be made complete
Good morning. I am Pastor Brian. I want to personally welcome you here this morning to the Lynchwood Church of God, and I want to share with you just a few things that I want everybody here to be aware of this morning. If you are a guest or visiting us for the first time, I want to invite you to our Welcome Center in the church foyer. We have a small gift we would like to give you, as well as provide any additional information about our church community that may be of help to you. The communication cards are located in the pews in front of you. Please keep us posted on your most up-to-date contact information. And if you're not receiving email updates from the office, be sure to check the box on the front of your card. On the back, we want to invite you to share prayer requests so that we can partner with you in prayer. These requests are prayed for weekly by the church staff. If you check the prayer ministry box, know that others in the church will be praying for you as well. And of course, be sure to check the confidential box for any private concerns you have. You can turn in your communication card at the Welcome Center or use the contribution boxes which are located in the church hallway. If you're interested in supporting Lynchwood financially, this is also where you can give by cash or by check. If you prefer to give electronically, please visit lynchwood.org, go to the side tab, and click the contribution link. Finally, we want you to know that we have a staffed nursery as well as a nursing area available for infants and small children. For children ages 4 to 11, you're going to be dismissed partway through the service for Children's Church. Parents, if you have a child that is going to participate in Children's Church, please make sure you sign them in each Sunday at the Child Check-In Station, which is located at the nursery. Again, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning, and now we want to inform you of just a few more things that are currently happening in our church community. Good morning. So, big changes here this morning. It will all be audio and video this morning. So if I'm off, I'm off. If they're off, they're off. We'll work together. I first wanted to wish a happy birthday to Rona Mark and Tanner Huff this morning. We wish you happy birthday. <clears throat> the directory updates and 2021 giving statements. Today's your final chance to update those things. If you aren't sure that your information is correct in the directory, please stop by out here in the foyer and sign, uh, check what we have. If it's inaccurate, please correct it. And giving statements, Jackie has just a few left out there. If you haven't picked yours up, pick it up today. Save us a, a bit of postage. Uh, Sunday link table conversations are happening in the gym. It is a good time to get to know people you haven't met before. It's a good time to talk about the message and other things that are going on in your life. Don't, don't not go because you'll be late for lunch. Stop in. Give it a try. Um, today at 2.30 is the memorial service for Gary Phelan. Everyone is welcome. And I know Diane appreciates mass required, mass required. Uh, next Sunday, first Sunday introductions with Pastor Brian. It's an opportunity to meet with Brian after the services um, over here in the Heritage Room, which is right over here. Um, he'll try to sneak out there as fast as he can <laughs> to meet with um, anybody who's interested in talking with him personally. Uh, annual business meeting and pie social coming up at 6 p.m. on there's no date on my sheet the next Sunday, next Sunday. <laughs> okay next Sunday at 6 um, everyone who attends here is um, and considers themselves a member is encouraged to attend there are annual reports that look like this out there on the welcome center table um, one for family, please, if you would like to know what's going on. It has the budget in and all the good things we'll be voting on. So it's important for you to come um, in the know. And there is also a register, registration to vote at Sign Up Central, which is out this door. Um, there's a bulletin board out there, so um, make sure you sign up and register to vote for that. Seniors events. Tuesday, February 8th at 4 p.m., uh, location is going to be announced yet. $20 per person is the senior Valentine's dinner. Reservations are required and also out here at Sign Up Central. Make sure you get signed up if you want to go. Seniors are also restarting their Bible study. So Thursday, February 10th at 1 p.m. It's a 12th week study on the Gospel of Matthew. It's $9 for the Max Lucado study guide and also sign ups are at Sign Up Central. 
Think Link Groups, a four-week study led by Dr. Lou Foltz from Ecclesiastes entitled, Listen to Your Life, Spiritual Development and the Cultiva Cultivation of Scriptural Wisdom. The group is limited to eight and is on a first-come, first-served basis, so please contact the church office or send an email to sign up for that. And finally, church camp out. We have the dates for church camp out, which will be July 7th through 10th, and it'll be at Fort St Stevens State Park. Details and reservations can be made. I'll be out there after service today. Um, you can reserve, the, you can pick your own spot this year for a $40 hold, and then the entire price is 113 So it's a really great time. Everyone should come. Also, which is not on my list, but the newsletters are out. They are also out there. Everything's a little bit jiggy on the table, so make sure you look what you're grabbing. Okay. Um, I'm going to open with prayer now. So can, could everybody please stand? Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you for the privilege it is to meet together, to lift our hands in your name, to praise you, to hear your word. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray for those present and those online this morning that you would cover us with your blood, that your grace and your mercy would surround us, and that we would be your people to those around us. Pray for the service, that you would be in it and about it, and that your name would be lifted up. In Jesus' name. Light of the world, you step down into darkness and open my eyes, let me see. And beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And King of all days, oh so highly exalted. Lord, us in heaven above, and humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sake we came poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I 
received my sight and now I am happy all the day was it for crimes that I have done that he groaned upon the tree cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day it was there by faith I receive my sight, and now I am happy all the day. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Could I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide And the peace, divinest comfort Here by faith in Him to dwell For I know whatever befall me Jesus doeth all things well For I know whatever befall me Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, all oh, the fullness of His love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. In my spirit clothed in mortal, its fly to realms of day. This my song to endless ages. Jesus led me all the way. This my song to endless ages. Jesus led me all the song to endless ages. Jesus led me all away. This my song to endless ages. Jesus led me all the way. You may be seated. Psalms 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his sur surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flute. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God's good, isn't he? You know, it's, it's been a, another tough week in the lives of a lot of people, but God has been faithful and God has watched over us. If you'll please take your prayer bulletin. This is always your handy way to take it home with you and 
remember some of the concerns in our church family. Just a quick update, Gene Zook went back to the hospital last night, but she's now home. Apparently he's had some mini strokes. Barry is here. Barry, good to have you back with us. He came straight from the hospital to choir practice last Wednesday. That's Barry Chappelle. And then Ellie Britton, breathing concerns and had a chance to spend a little time with Pastor Dan. He's doing good, but I think homecoming's getting closer. So pray for he and his, his wonderful, wonderful wife. And of course, you know as well as I do the number of people with COVID, the Nagels, especially Debbie, is having quite a battle. And then as we celebrate the life of Gary Phelan, uh, what a man of God, faithful, steady, was here right up until the end. So I really would encourage you to come at 2.30 today and share in his service. I want to just ask you if there's a special concern in your heart, maybe by an uplifted hand, let the Lord know, let us know that we'll be praying for you. Number of concerns. Would you please stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? I want you to always know the, the altars are always open to come and pray and spend that special time with the Lord. But let's just thank him for his goodness, for his grace, and let's praise him for who he is. And then I'll lead us in a prayer. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Lord, where would we be without you? Your comfort, your guidance, your forgiveness, your love, your very presence every day, every hour. You never sleep, you never slumber, you're with us always. There to care for us, there to help us, there to strengthen us, there to be with us when we lay our loved ones to rest, there to help us through the seasons of COVID. And Father, we don't understand all the reasons why this disease has really hit the whole world, but God, you know. And Father, remind us many times that you're still in charge, that this is our Father's world. And I pray that you'll be with those that are wrestling with various ailments with Jeannie and Barry and Ellie, Pastor Dan, Walter Perry, Kathy Ryan, Neil Britton, Richard Stothard, Dr. Marshall Christensen, Penny Duncan, Annie Haynes, Greg Thurman, and Diane Wingard. Lord, the list goes on and on, and these are just a few of the concerns we bring to you this morning because you're a God who wants to touch and heal your children. You want to walk with us, not only on the mountaintops of life, but Lord, you want to walk us through the darkest valleys. Your presence is always there, and we thank you for that. And we pray that you'll continue to be with this body of believers. Lord, as we assemble each week, and may this not be an hour or so that we come and, and listen, but Lord, may we be doers of the word. May we go out into the highways and byways and make a difference in our, in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in our city. May the light and the love of Christ truly shine through us. And then, Lord, I pray a special blessing of anointing on Pastor Brian as he again opens the word of God to us. Uh, Lord, help us to be about your work. We thank you for all you have done, for all you're presently doing, and for all you will do, because we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please remain standing? I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty, the great I am. Thee, God Almighty, the great I am. I want to 
be near, dear to your heart, loving the world and hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one. And shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in there or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. Great. Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, the great I am. Children, you're dismissed. This is one of those mornings I'm not done singing yet. I'm just not. I'm not done. Sing this with me and meditate on these words. Don't just lip it. Okay, we ready? All distractions gone. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul.
again. Listen to us as we sing. Listen to the Lord. Listen. Listen and participate. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Grab your Bibles this morning. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. And if you don't have a Bible in front of you, uh, I'm just going to read, read a section here and listen. Listen well. I'm going to start down, I'll start on verse 5, chapter 8, verse 5, and we're going to go all the way through verse 17. <clears throat> For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit mm, is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so, and all those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit whom raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, <laughs> he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under no obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if... By the Spirit, you are putting the, to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led of the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out, Abba, which means Daddy. Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified with him. Jesus, I pray that as we come here today, we have not come to do church. We've come to share in a fellowship. And Jesus, we invite you here today that we may have this time together. We thank you for coming to this world that we may know you and that you may know us. Open your word for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. All right. Um, Emery, I'm going to need your help. Sarah, you want to help? Of course. Be good. All right. So, <clears throat> have you guys, do you have refined palates? Have you ever done a taste test before? It's good. I got chocolate. You'll be fine. Okay. So, I brought with me three different kinds of chocolate. I got a white chocolate, I got kind of a medium chocolate, and I got a dark chocolate. Okay. And so, we're just going to do this one. Look, there's two pieces, one for each of you. So, this is not, don't worry, you won't fail this test, okay? So, I just want you to take, we'll start with the white, take the white, and then tell me what's going on in your mouth. Good. 
Okay. So, oh, I should get a microphone. It's right there. What do you think? That was a really measly bite. How can you taste it? It's very sweet. Oh, okay, good. So, um, kind of coats your mouth. That's nice, isn't it? It's good. You need another bite? Yeah, you need another bite. That's, you're eating like a bird. Okay, you're welcome. All right. Okay, nicely done, nicely done. All right, so now let's move up to the more medium-grade chocolate. Okay? I want you to tell me if you notice anything different. A little bit harder, okay. Definitely not as sweet. Not as sweet? Not as sweet. Okay, is it still good? Less flavor. Oh, okay. I agree. <laughs> You guys should get your own show. I mean, people would watch this. It'd be great. Okay, so let's move on to the dark chocolate. I think, was that not dark chocolate? No. That's a more of a medium chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Takes a moment to hit, but... <laughs> How are you doing, Emery? I don't like it. <laughs> Would you like another bite? No, I'm good. <laughs> have you ever heard of Baker's chocolate? Yes. Oh. Now you have. <laughs> if you'd like to take some of more of that white chocolate, you're welcome to it. <laughs> so that's very good. That's very good, right? So the difference between the first chocolate and the third chocolate in a nutshell. How, how was the last one? Good, bad, terrible, like on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being awful. 10. It was <laughs> the white is like a reward, and the other is like a punishment. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, there's leftovers here if any of you want them, all right? Yeah, it's good. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. You can take that. Yeah, you might need to suck on that for a while. If you, if you have... Uh, Come to core two, you've done that. I did it with the kids. Now I, I didn't want to do it in front of the whole church because it ruins my secret. But um, if you have not had Baker's chocolate, you're missing out in life. Let me tell you what. What is Baker's chocolate? It is chocolate that is missing a key ingredient. Sugar. That ingredient makes a big difference. And uh, I've done this with a group full of kids. And it's funny because they're all excited to have chocolate and they take a big old bite and they start, ah. It's not just like, oh, that's not pleasant. It's terrible. It's really bad. It, Baker's chocolate is, is super nasty, and it's actually very difficult to find Baker's chocolate that's disguised because they mark like half an ounce or something on there, and this one is disguised. It's good. So, but, you know, when it comes to chocolate, all the ingredients are important, right? You need cocoa for it to be chocolate, don't you? But there is one key ingredient, and if you don't have it, it ruins the whole thing. There is one key ingredient that if you take it out, it just, it destroys the mix. Jesus tells a parable in, in I think it's Matthew chapter 16. He says, the kingdom of God is like a leaven in which a woman took and hid in the flour. And the leaven leavened the entire lump of dough. And Jesus, again here, he's talking about this key ingredient where, you know, you got the flour, you got the oil, you got the salt and the water, and you mix it together. But without leaven, it changes the entire nature of the bread. The leaven changes everything about it. And so what Jesus is saying here is the same thing is true of the kingdom of God, is that there is one key ingredient that changes everything. In chocolate, there is one key ingredient that changes everything. The sugar content between those three was drastically different. All the ingredients matter, but there is a key ingredient that without it, it takes all the pleasure and all the joy <laughs> out of eating chocolate and by extension by eating bread. 
And this morning, I want to talk to you about this key ingredient. We are actually bringing the Sermon on the Mount to a close today, unless the Lord shall give me further. <laughs> it's been about a year, y'all. It's been about a year. But we are bringing the Sermon on the Mount to a close today, and I want to end in these words of Jesus as he brings it together. Right before his final illustration, you say, well, we didn't talk about the two houses. Actually, we did. It was a year ago. We started there, so we won't retract. But Jesus is bringing his sermon to a close, and he spent probably hours. I mean, we've spent a year, but he spent probably hours starting with the Beatitudes. And in these Beatitudes, talking about posturing our heart so as to put ourselves in a position to receive the favor of God. That's what the Beatitudes are. And he talks about the people. And he says, do you not know that you are the light of the world? That you are, you are the salt of the earth? The city on a hill cannot be hidden. Do you, he commissions them, and he begins to reveal to them this, the standard of God that it's not just don't murder, but there's a heart condition here where we have to deal with our hate. That justice isn't the ultimate good. That reconciliation is the ultimate good. He teaches us it's not just about not cheating or not um, having sex outside of marriage. <laughs> but it's about the heart. It's about lust. Right? It, it's about keeping our eyes and our, our minds pure. He talks about not just making oaths, but speaking the truth when we talk and living in grace by turning the other cheek, walking the second mile, praying for those who persecute us. He, he teaches us about the inner workings of the heart, even when we're doing righteousness, like giving or like fasting uh, or like praying, that there's an inner working of the, righteous, of the righteous heart that happens that is beyond public sight. He teaches us how to pray. He teaches us about money and storing up for ourselves treasures on he in heaven rather than treasures on earth and about anxiety and how God will supply your needs, and he knows you, and he cares for you, and that as you seek him, he will also take care of you. And he teaches us how to see others, not as being judgmental, but as a call to purify our own hearts, that we can see them well, and that we can help them with the things that ail them. He commands us to ask and to seek and to knock at the Lord because God wants to answer our prayers talks about the way being narrow. He says he won't find it by accident. And we've spent a year going through these things, and in one sense, we, we read these words of Jesus, which, was, which the, says later that he spoke these things in great authority. In one sense, it brings us great encouragement because we are actually hearing, if there was ever a sermon that was preached that was directly from the heart of God, this is it. This is the greatest sermon of all time because Jesus preached it, and I'm going to leave it at that. No one's topped it because there has never been a sermon more in line with exactly what the Father was saying than this one. And so in one sense, we leave empowered. We leave, because we leave feeling in, that we have gained understanding of the heart of God and the call of life. But in one sense, we also leave very, very overwhelmed because we realize just how far off the mark we actually are. We realize that the true heart of righteousness is not the one that we're carrying around from day to day. Amen? I guess it's just me, but that's all right. I'll confess. You all confessed to being adulterers a couple weeks ago. Marcus had you do it. I know you did. So, but Jesus reveals here this true ethic of life, this ethic of living in the way of the kingdom of God, and then he leaves us with this doozy, and this is our passage for today. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Not encouraging, right? Not encouraging. This is not the way that most Christian pastors this day want to close out their messages. We want people to feel better when they leave. I don't think Jesus left people feeling a whole lot better here in the immediate aftermath. 
Because what we hope for is that Jesus is sitting here saying, look, okay, the standard is so high. Only Jesus, only I can live up to this. But don't worry. God's got this. You're going to be, ever, you're going to be okay. Never fear. Jesus is here. He's going to take care of you and everybody else. But that is not how he closed his sermon. He did not set the bar and then back away from it and say, don't worry, it doesn't matter. He set the bar, and then he kind of doubled down here at the very end. He set the bar, and he says, look, and at the end of it all, as we're bringing it together, he says, look, the road is narrow, and few will find it. And then he says that there are going to be people along the way that are going to be false prophets that are going to deceive you and lead you away from it. And then he says, even those that look like they have it all together aren't necessarily going to enter in. And Jesus, I'm not really feeling very good about this sermon anymore. (laughs) I'm kind of in it for a happily ever after story. I kind of want the, where's the don't worry about it phrase? Where's the I've got this phrase? And so imagine being in the audience and you've been listening and listening and listening and you just heard really the most out of reach sermon you've probably ever heard in your life because all the other teachers are talking about at that age in life, at that era in life, they're all talking about things that you can do. And Jesus goes past all these things that you can do and he really rests in this heart condition that we really can't fix very easily or at all. And so we begin, what do you do in a situation like that? You hear what he says and, you know, you say, well, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, that's, that's not really me. Uh, blessed are the, or how about those that don't have anxiety? Oh, yeah, I got that one mastered until tomorrow. I'll pick that one right back up again. You know, uh, don't judge. Okay. <sighs> Oops. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And so we come to these, you know, pray for those who persecute you. Oh, sure, yeah, got that problem, no problem, until actually someone does. So Jesus gives us this kind of impossible bar, not kind of, and we start thinking, well, man, I don't fit the bill. And so what do we do when we think about when we don't fit the bill? What do we do? We begin to look around. I wonder who does. She's, she's a pretty sweet person. I bet she's the one that would get in. Not that guy. That guy's, that guy's worse than me. He ain't getting in. If I ain't getting in, that guy's not getting in. And we start assessing people, and we look at them, and how do we, how do we judge them, or how do we perceive whether or not they're qualified? We look at what we can see. There are certain actions that they do and things that they participate in that are evident to us, whatever is public, because we can't see one another's hearts. Guys, we don't even really know our own hearts. Man, I remember times in my life where things come out of my own heart, and I went, where did that come from? And I didn't really like it, but it was in there. And so we just kind of have to judge. We have to look around and say, man, who's going to fit the bill? Who's going to do it? And so we look at these people that live these extraordinary lives, and we say, man, it's got to probably be that person, right? And it's the people that we see doing the right things, that are saying the right things, that are living the right way. It's the same kind of people, unfortunately, that Jesus just described because he's, they, they, they labeled their defense. They said, but Lord, did we not in your name prophesy? In other words, to prophesy isn't just, it's not future telling. It's speaking the word of God. It is standing between a people and the Lord with his truth and passing that along. Did I not devote my life for your words to be heard, Jesus by people. And that's just not a public orator. That's when you sit and you have coffee with your friend, and you just say, Lord, what is your word in this situation? What do you want me to share? It's the voice of prophecy. So did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? And, uh, you know, now you're beginning to see this bar kind of raise up a little bit. You know, I don't know how many of you guys have had encounters with that stuff. As a pastor, we deal with that, but it's not really something that we sit down and say, hey, how was your uh, encounter with a demon last week? We don't really even venture into that category very often in lay conversations. And these are people with spiritual authority. These are people that recognize spiritual warfare. And he goes one step further and said, did we not perform miracles? And part of us, we, I even just begin to wonder, like, how is even all this possible for someone that doesn't get in? But that's just the point. 
is that these are people that we would, from the outside, look in and say, surely if anybody's going to get in, it's going to be that person. Look at the fruit of their life. And what does Jesus say to them? He says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In other words, the road is narrow and few are going to find it. You are going to be misled along the way by people trying to lead you astray as wolves in sheep's clothing. And the person that you think is in very well might not be in at all. Not a feel-good sermon from Jesus. wonder how many heard that and were discouraged. I mean, let's face it. If that person's not in, what hope do I have? It's not the only time Jesus said things that probably discouraged people. Jesus at one point said, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you'll have no part in me. Pretty much everybody but the 12 disciples left him at that point. So they didn't understand it. Jesus had a statement to a man who said, let me go bury my father first. He says, let the dead bury the dead. That probably went over like a lead balloon. Jesus was, said, it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. To which the disciple says that it's impossible. He said, yep, but through God all things are possible. You know, at Jesus, when Jesus began talking about his death, it didn't go over very well. There was a lot of things that Jesus said that when people first heard them, they're like, that's not a very encouraging thought, Jesus. I'm not really sure I'm following here. And this is one of those things that Jesus said that I do believe, like so many other things he said, that as you meditate on it and as you think about it later on, you begin to go back and go, oh, okay, now I'm beginning to get it. Now I'm beginning to understand it. So much of Scripture and so much of the Word of the Lord, it's really veiled in a sense that we don't really understand it the moment it comes. It requires that we work through it to understand it. There is a, there is a process that we just kind of have to meditate on and and stew on and reflect on before understanding comes out. And this one is the exact same. Jesus made this statement that I do believe we have to ponder for a while because if we don't ponder it, we're going to leave discouraged and say, well, nobody's getting in. Jesus has doubled down. He's raised the bar. And all he's saying is few will find it. Everybody's going to be misled. And even the people that we think we are going to end, or they're, not, they're not even going to make it. What hope is there for me? But Jesus says something here that we really have to listen for and understand. And it's there for those that are seeking it. But those that aren't, they'll walk away like the rich man did, not knowing what Jesus had to offer. But I do believe if we meditate on this for a moment, that our confusion will turn to understanding and our discouragement will be turned to encouragement. And uncertainty will come into certainty. Have you ever seen those? Do you guys remember the magic eye pictures? None of you do, because it's a terrible illustration if you don't. But there are these, I mean, they're paintings that just look like a nothing. They look like someone threw paint up there. But, if you, but they're actually three-dimensional. And so you look at them first, and you see nothing but smeared paint. But when you look at it just right, there's actually an image that will come out of, I don't know how they do it, but there's an image that will come out. And some people can see them real well, other people can't. I remember getting the books, I'd like look at it cross-eyed, and like try to back off like that and see if I could pull the image out. But it's that same kind of thing. We've got to sit in it, and we've got to see it, and then something beautiful comes out of it. So what, am, what are we missing here? Not all that say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father who is in heaven. But prophecy and casting out demons and performing miracles. And then Jesus says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's interesting that the prophecy and the casting out of demons and the, uh, the performing of miracles was their defense. And for good reason, because actually that's very defendable, because what, when Jesus sent out the 12, you can read about it in Luke chapter 9, but when Jesus sent out the 12, he had his 12 disciples, and at a certain point they were trained enough that he was going to send them out ahead of him so that he would follow them up and do ministry. He sent them out, and this is the command that he gave, Luke chapter 9, 1 and 2. Jesus called his 12 together, and he gave them power and authority to drive out demons, to cure diseases, 
So we have demons, we have works of miracles, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, prophecy. That's the will of God. And yet, they missed it. They missed it. And so you're thinking, you're meditating, all of a sudden it hits you. It wasn't what they were doing that was wrong. It was something they were missing. It wasn't the ingredients that were in the chocolate that was wrong. There was a missing ingredient that changed everything about it. Jesus says, look, only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And he rejected them. Why? Because I never knew you. He didn't reject them because of what they did. He said, I never knew you. <laughs> this changes everything. Because the will of God is not simply, meaning it is, but it is not only good deeds. Those ingredients matter. But the will of the Heavenly Father is that you would know Jesus and Jesus would know you. That's the will of God that you would know Jesus and Jesus would know you. Let this hit you for just a minute because here is this, look, again, this most epic sermon of all time, these standards of true righteousness, heart righteousness, the ethic of the kingdom of God has been made manifest to you. And you heard it straight from the mouth of God himself. And then he says here at the end of it all, he says, here is the point of it all. Here's why this standard exists. Here's why this message has come. The whole purpose is so that you will know Jesus and Jesus will know you. And at the end of the sermon, he throws in the leaven. He throws in the sugar. He throws in the thing that changes. It does not get rid of the cocoa. It does not get rid of the need for flour or for oil. But there's a leaven. There's another ingredient that changes everything, and it's the relationship with God himself. So don't be grossed out when I say this, and do not over-apply this. I'll say it again, do not over-apply this. But the word that Jesus uses here, I never knew you, that word gnosko, is the idiom for relations between a husband and a wife. So don't over-apply that, but what he's saying here is, I never intimately had a relationship with you. I, we never knew each other. And you see the heart of Jesus is literally breaking in this statement. In other words, what Jesus is grieving is that people have spent their whole lives working for the church, but they never knew Jesus. They missed the point of it all to begin with. I'm going to drive this home, I hope, with a story that you can probably relate to uh, on some level. And it's not a perfect analogy. Don't try to put... I don't know what I'm saying. Don't try to put us in God or in this, but just forget everything I just said. Let's just go for it. I just made it way worse, so forget. All right, what's this little? Okay, look directly into the light here. I'm going to flash you guys. All right. Um, I have three boys, all wonderful, all different. And last spring, my middle child, Caleb, decided he wanted to have a garden. I grew up gardening. I take that back. My parents gardened it. I was there uh, a little bit. I picked some green beans and some corn, and that's pretty much about it. I remember putting my thumb in and dropping the seeds and that kind of thing, but I don't, I, I don't know all that much about gardening. But Caleb wanted a garden, and so guess what Dad did? I said, go to the store like everybody else. I didn't do that. No, um, we got the tiller out, borrowed a tiller, and we tilled up the ground, we put some compost in there, and we went to the store, and we got a bunch of seeds, and we planted all the seeds, and we watered, and we weeded, and we made a garden. And the weeds did really well. <laughs> the, uh, the, the heat wave in June was not helpful. I'll use that as an excuse. So we did lose some things, but we, we were able to get a few things out of it. Not bad for our first year. Why did I do that with Caleb? Was it because Caleb's love for me was conditional upon me gardening with him? No. Was it because Caleb and the rest of the family would starve to death if I didn't farm? Let's hope not. 
Was it because the world is depending on Brian's agricultural ability in his backyard? Interestingly enough, is gardening important? It is the sustenance of life. We need gardens and we need people that can do them well. It is irreplaceably important. But why does Brian garden if the whole world doesn't depend on Brian? Or even Caleb doesn't depend on our garden? It was important to Caleb. He wanted to do it. So what do you do as a dad? You spend time together doing those things. You know, the food is important, but listen to me, the relationship that you build growing the food is equally as important. Participating in the garden was an opportunity to know one another better and to spend time with each other. Why do we as parents do all of these crazy things with children? If you have a daughter, you might do a tea party. I have never done one of those. But we have forts like crazy at our house. We've had to make rules about forts. There's always forts. There's the dress-ups. There's, going to, there's playing t-ball. And t-ball is fun if you're a parent on the sidelines. If you have to coach, whew, that's rough. But soccer and camping and cooking, all these things we do at Y, not so that the job can get done, not because, well, there's tea, someone needs to drink it, not because there's a soccer ball, someone needs to kick it in the net, not because we need to teach a kid to hold the bat right side up. You do it because of the relationship that's formed around these things. Am I right? You follow me here? Okay. I build a relationship with my children by joining in the things that they love. This is exactly what Jesus just did in this sermon, and this is how we're going to bring this all together. Jesus just revealed God's garden. That which he loves and that which produces life for all people. But equally as important as the garden is the relationships that are formed in God the garden, while doing the work of the garden. You following me right now? Jesus has just revealed to us. See, I know that there are certain people that I can do certain activities with, and there I can meet them in relationship. Whether it's building a car or going snowmobiling or playing music, I know that there are certain people. I get to meet them in those activities. I know where to find them. I can meet them there and build a relationship. This is what Jesus is saying. Look, you want to know where God is at work. You want to know where you can find him so that you can be with him. He's at work in these things and in these, in these parts of people's lives and in parts of people's hearts. You can meet him here But don't just go to the garden, pull a few weeds, never say a word, and walk away from the relationship that is supposed to be built in the midst of work. We're being invited to do something together. And Jesus says the key ingredient, the thing that changes this entire sermon, we actually now go all the way back and go, all of these things, all of these things are actually relationally based because these are, this is where God is at work. He said, if you want to build a relationship with him, you have to come to where I am. And this is where I'm working. This is what I'm doing. I'm in the hearts of those who are poor in spirit and who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The ones who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers and gentle. I'm I'm with those who are letting their light shine in the world and refusing to lose their saltiness in the midst of a generation that has forsaken truth. I, I'm with those who are clinging and holding to living a life that's righteous, not just in deed, but in heart, and wanting to be faithful uh, to rebuilding relationships and restoring relationships, being faithful to sexual purity, uh, being faithful to our spouses, being faithful to speak that which is true, being faithful to offer grace rather than judgment. The list goes on and on. If you want to meet Jesus, this is where you meet him. You meet him in the garden of righteousness. Let's go back to chocolate. And we'll close here. I'm not going to put that in my mouth. I am chicken. I've done it before. 
but you're more than welcome to come prove you're not. I got extras in the office. The kingdom of God is like leaven, which is hidden in a lump of dough. It affects every part. It's one ingredient, but it's one ingredient that changes them all. The kingdom of heaven is like sugar and chocolate. It's one ingredient, but it changes them all. And this whole sermon, what Jesus is inviting us to, he says righteousness. Righteousness is the cocoa. Righteousness is the food that's produced in the garden. Righteousness is the flour. It's, it's the corn, it's the syrup, or the, the, the oil, it's the salt of the bread. But relationship is the sugar. It's the leaven. It's the relationship that's built in the garden. It really is the most amazing sermon ever told. And as we close it out, I just want to say to each of you, don't miss the point. Don't garden with your children only there to pull weeds, but not to be with them. And don't live all these things out, but miss the relationship that they were made to bring together. Father, thank you so much for teaching us this past year the ethic and the nature of your kingdom. It is a high standard of righteousness. It is your standard of righteousness. But it's given so that we may know you and fellowship with you and the things that are important to you. And I ask, Lord, that we would never see our acts of righteousness as a tasty chocolate. But Lord, it's only unleavened bread and baker's chocolate because you strive, the will of God is that we would know Jesus and Jesus would know us. That's your will. And that is profound and powerful. Not only may we never forget it, but may we enjoy it. What is the chief aim of man? To worship God and enjoy him forever. May that be our goal and our cry and our heart. Amen. Would you please stand? Nearer, my God, to Thee, nearer to Thee, in all
you know, maintaining a relationship with someone physically, as I have a friendship with, you know, Kevin or Jared, it's different than a spiritual relationship. Fair? I want to invite you to link to discuss those kinds of things. We could learn how to cultivate this relationship in the garden with Christ. If you don't have it, you're just a baker's chocolate. I want to pray for you this morning. When I say amen, we're going to sing I love you, Lord, one more time. So don't walk away yet. Jesus, I pray that we would know you. And that you would know us. We do not come to a religion that we think can save us or works that can accomplish anything. Lord, just like food, we can give food to a person who still will die on the inside and will have no life because life is more than bread and water. It's about love and sharing it with one another. And I thank you that as you closed this mighty message from the Father, you told us the will of God is that we would know you and that you would know us. What a beautiful God we serve. Thank you for loving us. And teach us how to love you in return. I love you. And I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. stables will start up in about 10 minutes over in the gym. Uh, We also want to invite you back this afternoon at 2.30 for Gary's service. And then don't forget uh, Dr. Lou is going to be offering a class coming up in a couple weeks. If you're interested in that, please contact the office. You're dismissed.